of the Lord. He is a mighty, awesome God. Hallelujah. Son said, no praise. It's high enough to express how great God is. He's a mighty God. He's a great God. He's a loving God. He's a kind God. He's a forgiving God. He's a saving God. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. He's good. He's so good. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for our worship team leading us in worship on this morning. Amen. We're going to go to the Word of God and see what the Lord has to say today. What he has to say on today. Uh, I'm going to ask that you would turn your Bibles to Judges. The seventh chapter, we start at the first verse, Judges 7. I'm going to do quite a bit of reading on today. So, please be patient with me. I'm going to read Judges 7. The word of God says, so Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Harad. The armies of Midian were kept north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid, they may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 out of the 32,000 left and went home because they were timid and or afraid, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. Verse 4, But the Lord told Gideon, There are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will sort them out. I will test them to determine who will go with you and who cannot go. And Gideon took his warriors down to the water. The Lord told him, Divide the men into two groups. One group put all those who cut water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. And the other group put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Six says only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300... Men, I will rescue you and give you victory over your enemies, over your problems. Send all the others home. They can't be here. Send them home. Send them home. Send them home. Uh, we're going to move up just a tad bit. I want to look at something else. I want to look at something else. Let's read verse 9. Let's read verse 9. The Bible, oh, excuse me, let's go to verse 8. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept the 300 men with him. The Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. Verse 9, that night the Lord said, get up, go down into the Midianite camp. For I have given, I've already given, I've given you the victory over them. But the Lord says, if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Purah. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. So Gideon took Purah and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. The armies of Midian, I said he went down to the camp of his enemies, 
These were the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east. According to Judges 8 and 10, it was a total of 135,000 people. And remember I said Gideon only had 300. That was, if we do our math, that was 450 men to one of Gideon's men. 450 of his enemies to one of Gideon's warriors. This was an impossible situation. It was a hopeless situation. It was a desperate situation. It was a disparaging situation. But God said, it's too many people. Send all of them home and with the 300, excuse me, that I have selected, you'll get the victory. With the 300, that's 450 men to one of your men. And I'm pretty sure Gideon scratches in and said, what in the world? How can I get victory with such a little amount of people? So he goes in verse 12, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. This is how many people it was. Gideon took Parai and went down to the edge of the enemy's camp. Then the Bible says in 13, verse 13, Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. That's verse 13. His enemy is talking about him. The man said, I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. His companion answered, your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over all of his enemies. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. We're going to finish our series, A New Day is Coming. Today, we're going to look at the strategy, the strategy of God will always work. The strategy of God will always work. Strategy is a noun. It is a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major or overall aim. It's a plan of action. Now, a lot of us have different plans. And some of our plans come from our own minds. And some of them come from other people. But we said God's strategy works. Every last time. Even though his strategy may look silly, it may even make you look like you are foolish. God's strategy works every time. Now, Jesus told the disciples to go and feed the people. And one of the disciples said, look, hold up, it's a lot of people out here Several thousand out here, but we got this little boy who has a couple of pieces of fish and a biscuit that his mother had made him for lunch, and he was willing to give it to God. Now, the disciples could have embarrassed the little boy, said, wait, 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 what are we going to do with that? But they allowed this young man to bring his sack lunch, probably in a brown paper bag with a little bit of fish grease on it, but he was willing to share what he had with God. And I, I want to say this, that little, little is much when you put it into the hands of the Almighty God. Little, little is much. When you put it into God's hands. It, he, so it said that he blessed it, he broke it, he blessed it, and he, 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 he sent it out and everybody was able to eat and got full and there was leftovers. When you give what you have to God, there will be enough to serve everybody and there's more where that came from. Amen. That came from. The strategy of God 
doesn't necessarily make sense, but it will always work. Normally when people go off, we tend to want to clap back. When they talk to us crazy, we talk to them crazy. When they're mean, we get mean. But, but God says a soft answer puts out a fiery wrath. It doesn't make sense, uh, Minister Lisa, that the response that God says, love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Normally, in my flesh, I'll be like, look, if they do this one more time, I'm going to let them have it. And sometimes, we can even premeditate the process. We'll stick our shoulder out. If you touch me, I'm going to let you have it. But God's way of doing things is so much different. He says, pray for your enemies. What do you mean by that? His strategy always works, but it does not always make sense. The Bible says, give and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down and shake it over. Shall men give into your bosom? What? Wait a minute. I already need. But you're telling me to give. Wait a minute. Usually I need to hold on to what I have. But when you give what you have to God, yes. he expands it. He increases it. He grows it. And so therefore you release it. It does many things. It humbles you. And then because you were willing to share what he gave you, in the first place, he says, I'm going to hook you up. And then you hook somebody up. So when you give in the face of your negative situation, it blesses you by humbling, humbling you. It increases you because God said, when you give, I'm going to give back to you. And then just many people are blessed because you give. It's a strategy that we really don't want to follow. But it works. God's plan works. God's system works. You, it may seem like you are always getting the short end of the stick. And in my spirit, I just heard the scripture. Paul said, preferring others. That's not my plan. That's not my strategy. But God said, put others first. Promote others. Build others. Give it a little bit. Even though you don't have much, the woman with uh, she said, all I have is enough meal to make me and my son something to eat. And after we eat that, we are going to die. But the prophet Elijah went to the brook Cherith. God fed him at the brook. The brook was cutting away. And then God said, I want you to go down to the town where there's a woman. She's going to sustain you. And then when he gets down to this woman's house, she only has enough food for one meal for that moment. And he said, give me what you have. Make me a little bit of cake first. That doesn't make sense. What woman do you know is going to give their little boy that baby's food to a grown man? But when God tells you to do something, you do what God says because his strategy will always work. Take down. Yield. You got it. Get it. Listen, you don't have to always be the first in line. God's strategy will work. So synonyms for strategy is a master plan, a grand design, a game plan, a plan of action, a policy, a blueprint, a schematic, a schedule of events. The wall of Jericho, when they marched around the wall, it doesn't make sense for people to march around the wall so many days. That, that, how can you knock down a wall that it has apartments in the wall? Apartments in the wall. Several chariots of horses could run around on the wall. It was an impenetrable situation. But God said, tell them not to say anything and to march around the wall. We will mess up right there. Don't say that. Don't let the dogs bark. You better teach. You listen, you better teach Deputy Dog to shut up. 
God said, don't bark. Don't let the cats meow. Don't let, listen, don't let the cows move. Teach them how to be quiet and teach them, listen, don't let them talk. Don't let the kids talk. Don't say nothing. Don't complain. Just mark around the wall. Mark around the wall. And when I get the trumpet on the last day, I want you to mark and I want you to shout with the loudest shout and the walls will go down. Listen, when you follow the plan of God to the T, it'll work. Doesn't have to make sense. It'll work. How can I do such a great thing? How could Gideon deliver? It doesn't matter because when you put God in the mix, it'll work. Take God out of the church. It's just a big old Take God out of your marriage. It's just a business relationship. Woo. Take God out of your business. You ain't going nowhere. But when you get God involved, get him in the game, God is the GOAT. He's the greatest of all time. Get him in any situation, even in a negative situation. He'll work it out. For oh my good. All things are working together. For oh my good. Jehoshaphat. Says, we're in a situation. We don't know what to do. All of these armies came against them. And he said, look, the Bible, I love the story. The King James says that it was the King Jehoshaphat. All of his men, all of their wives, and the Bible says, and their little ones was looking. Listen, I'm saying, I'm going somewhere. Parents, your children are watching your move. And how you handle your difficult situation is going to set the tone on what they're going to do when they get in a difficult situation. Listen, so as you watch God, your kids are watching you, or whatever you are watching, if you complain about difficult situations, your kids will complain. If you trust God in difficulty, your kid, your friends will take on your attitude. What are we showing them? But Jehoshaphat, the strategy was, God, we don't know what to do, but we're watching you. We're watching you. God says, go down to the battle. Go down to the valley. Go down, and then I want you to praise me down there. And God got busy, and God began to whoop some tail. How do I defeat my enemy but just praising God? That doesn't even make sense. I don't need to bring a knife. I don't need to bring a, a, a gun. I, God said, go down and praise me. It takes faith to praise God in a difficult situation. I can't see my way through. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't see tomorrow from looking at today. There's, there's a storm on the horizon raging. It's flooding. Listen. Texas right now can't see their way through. But God, yes, amen. if he brought me to, he'll bring me to. And I'm going to say something right here. If you're expecting to live a life with no problems, you might as well give it up now. There will be ups and downs, smiles and frowns. I, 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 listen, I'm telling you, Life is full of trouble, but God. I want a baby and seem to have one, but God. Have you prayed about it? Have you talked to him about it? It doesn't matter how silly it is. One of my brothers of the church said, Pastor, I want you to pray for my puppy. He, he's acting up. He's shaking. And, and so we can pray about anything, no matter what I prayed and he said, my puppy is doing better. God answers prayer. God moves. The strategy is to bow down and worship. The strategy is to submit and say, God, I don't know what to do, but you do. I don't know about tomorrow, but I know the one who knows about tomorrow. I know the one who knows everything. And if you said it, so be it. I trust you. I trust you. You love me. I trust you. You committed to me. I trust you. You for a for me. I trust you. Even though I'm sick, I trust I trust you. I trust you. I trust you because you're God and you're God. David said, the Lord of the universe is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
My God runs everything. My God makes everything. My God put Jupiter out there. My God put Saturn out there. He's the God of the world. And he's my Lord, my master, and my savior. I have no reason to fear. Uh, his strategy works. I like the text. I like the text. It talks about the strategy. I, I think Gideon story is about faith. Faith is the victory. Faith. It means I don't see it, but it causes me to move and there's no evidence, but the faith is the proof of the evidence of an infant. It's an invisible evidence because God said, you cannot see him, but he told me to do something. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1 through 2, and then 5 through 6. I'm moving slow, but we're going to move. We're gonna, it says the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. I'm reading from the Message Bible. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. 5 and 6. It says by an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he is and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. You know why we don't talk to God? Because we're, we're trying to accept the reality that he exists. And then if he exists, we cannot accept the fact that God, who is absolutely perfect, who has all power, loves me. We don't run away from people that love us. Even when I mess up, we should run to him. He exists and he loves us is the victory. 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 14 says, well, you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these things, pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight is agonizo. Ag it means to agonize. It's a contest. It's the fight to believe God no matter what I see, no matter what they say, no matter how I feel. I can't see it, but he's there. I fight the good fight of faith. I don't know how it's going to happen, but God said it. I don't know how I'm going to get a place, but God said it. I don't know how I'm going to get that promotion, but God said it. Whatever God says, whatever God promises, he's able to do it. My God will do just what he said. He will do. He's God. You've got to trust him. Fight the good fight of faith. Yes. Devil was trying to take my faith away. But hold on and keep the faith. Yes. Faith is the substance. First uh -huh. John 5, 4 through 5 from the CEV. It says every child of God can defeat the world. And our faith is what gives us the victory. Gideon's faith in God and moving on what God said was the victory. Why do you think the Lord kept reassuring? You're going to win, Gideon. You're going to win, Gideon. I've given it to you, Gideon. I stripped you down, but you're going to win, Gideon. You're going to win, Gideon. He was, he, the Bible says the word of faith we preach. The word of God is the word of faith. We have to be reminded daily, I am an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things. I will bless him. He is my Lord. I can do it. I win because God says it. And whatever God says, stands. We've got to rest. Listen, we've got to rest in what God says. We've got to relax in what God says. Thou, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. Thou, O oh Lord, are the glory and the lift of my head. Many are rising up against me, but you push my enemies back. You're a shield of love and protection around me. That's what the Bible says. It's the word of faith. We need to be 
continuously, continuously reassured. Gideon needs to be reassured because it's almost like Gideon had a gas tank and the, and the faith would bleed out. So God said, nope, get in more. Nope, hear it again. We've got to be reminded every week. God said it. I believe it. I'm settled. I'm coming now because God said it. I believe it. God said it. Gideon needed reassurance on a regular basis. It's the fight of faith. Listen to this. Christians are either overcome because of their unbelief or overcomers because of their faith. Jesus said, according to your faith, according to your faith, do you believe what I said? Do you trust me? Do, listen, Gideon had to believe what God said. He had, he had nothing to hold on but what God said, Isaiah 53 and 1 says, whose report will you believe? First of all, we know how to believe the report. We believe what the CDC says. We believe what the WHO says. We believe what NBC says. We believe what ABC says. We believe what CBS says. We believe what ABC, DEFG, WSYZ. We believe every alphabet, but we cannot believe what God said. We believe Instagram. We believe TikTok. We believe, we believe, we believe Twitter. We believe, you believe everything, but the only one that you can rely on is God. He said it, we believe it. He's perfect. He Listen, he, he, he loves you. So we know how to believe. What are you going to believe? You can't even believe yourself. Believe God. Gideon had nothing to go on with what God said. True faith is taking what God said without the evidence. Fight of faith. Listen, faith doesn't depend on how we feel. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on what we see or what may happen. And listen, a faith that cannot be tested can't be trusted. If your faith only works when when it when it when it when it when it when, it, when it's rainbows and skills, yeah. you ain't got no faith, baby. Your, your faith is whack and weak. Huh. It's a dead faith. I'm sorry, we're we gonna do double dust. What? Listen, the storm is raging, the battle is serious. The Bible says put on the whole armor. The, you, to apply the armor, it requires faith. Why do I need armor? Because I'm in the battle. Why do I need to trust? Because it looks like I can't trust. Why? We've got to trust God. Gideon took 300 men that was, that, listen, that was downsized from 32,000 men to fight 135,000 men 450 to 1, and God said we can win with that amount of people. What? It requires faith. Amen. Too often, what people think is faith is really only a warm, fuzzy feeling mm -hmm. <laughs> about faith, or perhaps faith in faith. Uh -uh. Our faith belongs in God. We will trust in the Lord. We will rest in the Lord. Listen, J.G. Stipe said that faith is like a toothbrush. Everybody should have one and use it regularly. But it isn't safe to use somebody else's toothbrush. <laughs> we can sing loudly about the faith of our parents, but we can't exercise the faith of our parents. We can follow men and women of faith and share in their courageous exploits, but we cannot succeed in our own personal life by depending on somebody else's faith. God tests our faith for at least two reasons. Number one, he tests our faith to make sure it's real or counterfeit. You better get, you better, you better get a, a $20 bill detected. That $20 bill is look real. They got to put it through that machine and like, no, nah, you didn't pass. Get that dollar out of here. Get that money out. Your faith has to be real. And, and, and listen, Warren Wiersbe said, I've noticed in my own life and ministry that God has often put us through the valley of testing before allowing us to reach the mountain peak of victory. You know why it's tough? You know why it's difficult? You know why the struggle is really, really real? 
Because God is trying to do something in your life. And the devil knows it. And your enemy knows it. And if he can stop you, he will make what God is trying to do. It will abort the potential. It will shut down the prosperity. Whatever. If you stop short of what God is trying to do because of the struggle, what he said he would do will never happen. Faith without works is dead. Dead. <laughs> the fight of faith. Spurgeon was right when he said that the promises of God shine brightest in the furnace of affliction. And it is in claiming those promises that we gain victory. You know why it's difficult? Because of lessons on the way. The devil's trying to push you back. Get, the Lord says, go down and listen to your enemy. Listen to your enemy. Check this out. His enemy said Gideon is a loaf of bread. Now, the only good thing about a loaf of bread, when you put water on it, is mushroom. How in the world can a loaf of bread, barley bread, roll down and knock over a tent? Because God was involved with that little old cheesy, uh, weak loaf of bread. When God gets involved with your life, you are not just a little piece of loaf of bread. You're not a weak sack, a weak whip. You are somebody in God. Greater is he that's in me. When weakness gets with Godness, things happen. Victory happens. Triumphancy happens when you apply the two. But and, and, and a good point. Thank you. I heard that. Thank you. I hear you. Take God out the situation. You just a piece of bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop trying to do it on your own. You ain't that. You ain't nothing. You ain't all that. But get God in the game. Right. Amen. Man, you're not all that. Just trying to help you. The Lord said it's too many people getting in. Verse 7, he says, he tells him, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Listen to this. Listen to this. this niece, listen to this. Some, I want to listen, check this out. Some amazing points of interest we want to consider. Gideon had 32,000 warriors that came to fight. That's the first point, right? The Lord reduces them down to 300. That's, uh, and, and then Judge 17 says it was 135,000 men, and his 300 warriors were preparing to fight. The math is 450 to one person. We said that, right? Uh, but it was an impossible situation. The numbers didn't add up. There just isn't enough. Little is much when we give it to God. And listen, Roberta Martin says that have you any rivers that seem uncrossable? And have you mountains that you cannot tunnel through? God specializes in things that are impossible. And he will do what no other power, no other Holy Ghost power can do because God is involved. It'll happen. I love that. Mark 10 and 27. Jesus said this. He looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible. I want a baby. It's impossible. But have you, have you sincerely talked to God about it? Listen, and if God hasn't said no, keep on praying. Keep on pressing. Keep on trusting. Keep on praying. Keep on pressing. Keep on trusting. And then, if he doesn't move through that method, you know it's a whole lot of cute babies that can be adopted. They would love to, they would love to have your last name. We got, we, got, we, got, we got people in our families, kids in our families that need a parent. I'm just saying, trust God, trust the strategy, and be grateful. I'm just trying to help you. That's all. That's all. I love the Lord. Listen, now look at this. Out of the 32,000 warriors, 300 were sovereignly handpicked. Handpicked by God, which was less than 1%. Had it been up to Gideon, he would have picked all his boys. I'm going somewhere. The ones that were easy going. The ones that looked a certain way. And the ones that dressed a certain way. Listen, yes, even in the church, we are very prejudiced on who can serve with us in our communities. I want you to serve with me. Prejudice. No, you don't look like, no, we prejudice. We're in the church. No, you know, I ain't picking you. You ain't going to be on my team. That's why God picked the crew. That's right. That's right. I didn't pick my siblings. 
The ones I love, the ones I love to irritate me, the ones I love, love, I didn't pick them. God picked them. So what do we do? We deal with it. We work with it. We make it happen. That's what we do. But had Gideon done it, Gideon would pick everybody. But the Lord picked. So even in the church, we're prejudiced on who can serve with us. I thought about this as I was preparing for today's sermon. I can guarantee you that out of the 300 words that God selected, some were not Gideon's favorite. I'm going somewhere. Oh, it's going to be good. Or his preferred choice. I am sure that Gideon looked at some of them and was like, God, are you for real? Are you serious? You've got to be kidding me. All of these people you could have selected for my team, you chose this one. Listen, real leadership takes who you have been given and bring out the hidden beauty of ability. Real leadership. It, you, you, it, you, you don't get an assignment and prove your leadership ability by I'm getting the best of this, the best of that, the best of this. No. I got a team. Work with the team I've given you and make something great out of the team. Yes, yes. Just because they don't think like you, yes. just because they don't look like you, yes. utilize who I've given you. And it is the leader's job to discover their hidden talent or their hidden ability, the beauty of their ability. And every person in your team has at least one ability that you need that is, a, that is necessary for your success. You, you, you don't, don't, skip, don't, don't push them away. Work with them. And it ain't going to be easy. First Samuel 22, 1 through 2, David took 400 men. And the Bible says, and everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and the ones that were discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. They were distressed, discontented, and they were in debt. That was a jacked up situation. But a real leader brings out the hidden beauty of ability. That's a, that's a real leader. Imagine if you could take someone who was messed up, messed over, damaged, not damaged, damaged, but damaged goods. Get past the damage and bring out the goods. Some people need to be appreciated. Amen. Amen. They say when a person is appreciated, they'll give way more. Appreciate. I'm almost done. It amazes me how that once we get halfway delivered, <laughs> getting a leadership role in the church, a piece of education, a new car, a better job with a couple extra dollars in the bank, now we are too good to deal with certain people as if we are better. Now listen, I just wonder how some of us would act if we didn't have the leadership role. Or the education, or the new car, or the better job, or a couple extra bucks. We get too good for people. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. Remember where you came from? It's easy. It's so crazy how we forget where we came from. Mm -hmm. You get ugly, like, what? We know you. You got, I, we know your story. Mm -hmm. Hey, and it wasn't skills and rainbow. <laughs> but listen, in the famous words, of Jonathan McReynolds. He says, they are the best and the worst you created. Loving and hating and opinionated. Loners in basements and those congregated, deliver me. Far from the peaceful shore of, uh, I was sinking deep in the ocean of thoughts they were thinking. Don't know what validation I was seeking. Deliver me from People, people, when you said you could heal me from anything, did you mean people? People, deliver me because I can't point them out. I won't say their names. I don't know the damage or which one to blame. It's just people. People, deliver me. She was the reason I smiled in the morning. He took the last bit of joy I was storing. That's too much power for anything for anything human. Deliver me from people. People, I know you can heal me from anything. What about people? People, deliver me. Because I can't point them out. I won't say their names. I don't know the damage or which one to blame. It's just people. People, deliver me. All oh, the hurt, 
are hurting and the broken are breaking and the ones who had their joy taken away are out there taking from other people, 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 forgive these people, people heal me from people, people crazy, people, people trolling, people, people self-righteous people, people entitled, and I said entitled people, people that are hating, people that are lying, people that are disrespectful, people forgive me when I'm one of those. How could Gideon get up in you? Yeah. You were scary, mm -hmm. fearful, yes. and weak. Mm -hmm. And now you, you, you scrutinizing the team? Mm -hmm. A real leader comes from a situation, doesn't forget about the situation, learns something about a situation, and uses it, uses it as a tool to develop his team. Because some of, some of the characteristics in his team is in him. Helping somebody. God's strategy will always work. We're going to stop right there. We'll finish. We'll finish. We'll finish. Listen, we love you. Okay. And we're praying for you. I pray that you heard something that blessed your spirit. We know that God is able to do just what He said He would do. And is equipped and adequate to handle your situation. So we're praying for you. We love you. And we're asking that you would give your life to God. You don't have to fix your life. You don't have to do anything but give your life to God. And let him change you piece by piece. Moment by moment. And keep on walking, moving forward. Every now and then, look back and see how far you've come. But don't forget from where you come from. And remember to get those other people that you were just like and sometimes still act like. Because you could be one of those people. people. Amen? So we invite you to the king. If you feel led to be a blessing to church beyond walls, you can do so. Uh, via Cash App, which is the dollar sign church beyond walls. Uh, we can you can do so at Venmo our, our Venmo platform, which is at Church Beyond Walls. You can do so via Zelle, and you can do that at nine five one five two 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 one two five. And then, if I, I would be remiss not to say this, we're inviting you to be a part of this fellowship. We cannot do God's work alone. We need you, and check this out: you need us. We're praying for you. We love you. I'm gonna ask. Uh, uh, First lady, our first lady, she don't like when I say that, but that's who she is. <laughs> no, she said, I'm the only lady, I'm the only lady. Come, come, give us out of worship. Mm -hmm.